Welcome to the Revenue Builders Podcast, a weekly show featuring B2B sales leaders and executives. Hosted by five-time CRO John McMahon and force management co-founder John Kaplan, the show goes behind the scenes with the people who have been there, done that, and seen the results. If you enjoy our content, please subscribe, rate, and review the show to help us reach more people. Revenue Builders is brought to you by Force Management. We help companies improve sales performance, executing the growth strategy at the point of sale. Find us at forcemanagement.com. Enjoy today's episode. Hello and welcome to the Revenue Builders podcast. I'm John McMahon here with the one, the only, drum roll, the big, bad Johnny Kaplan. Cap, what's Johnny, going on, buddy? <laughs> Johnny McMahon, how you doing, brother? Great I'm to see great. you again. I'm doing great. Hey, Cap, our guest today played ice hockey at the University of Wisconsin. He was drafted by the Boston Bruins. He moved on to play three seasons in the AHL, which is the American Hockey League, for those that don't know. And the AHL is just underneath the NHL or the National Hockey League, for those that don't know what hockey is. And a knee injury there during a practice ended his playing career. But since then, he's coached for 27 years in both Europe and the United States. For instance, he was one-time head coach for the German national team. He also won the German championship with the Mannheim Eagles and won the ECHL championship with the Florida Everblades. After that, he started a company named Stark Mind, where he coaches collegiate and professional athletes on mental toughness. He also wrote a book called Fearless, The Winner's Mind. Now, it's not a book on sports psychology, Cap, like a lot of those books. It's about reprogramming and rewiring your brain where you change a person's mental approach to competing. Cap, please help me welcome my friend, coach, and author, Greg Poss. Hey, Greg, how are you, buddy? Good, good. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, we're really, really looking forward to this conversation. It's a, uh, I I think our listeners are really, really going to enjoy it. Johnny, kick us off. Yeah, Greg, let's first walk through your career career progression. Like from the time you were at the University of Wisconsin, because then you went into coaching. Walk everybody through that, because I think that's a big part of you, your story, and, you know, why you started, you know, writing a book on mental toughness and coaching athletes on that. So walk everybody through that a little bit. Yeah, I would say that the journey really started in when I was like 12, 13 years old. I just always noticed I would always have one good year and one year that wasn't so good. And it kind of continued that way uh, right through junior hockey. In fact, um, I had to go to University of Wisconsin as a walk-on. I wasn't even offered a, a scholarship. Um, and for whatever reason, whenever I got into that state where I had nothing to lose, I was just so much more powerful and performed so much better. And, you know, going to Wisconsin as a, as a walk-on, it's an excellent uh, Division One hockey program. Um, I had nothing to lose, and I was from – I raised born. I was raised in Green Bay, Wisconsin. So, um, and I ended up making the team as a defenseman when I originally played forward, um, and then played four years. I wasn't drafted by the Boston Bruins. I was never drafted. In fact, uh, hey, I was a free agent. My mistake. <laughs> so that's okay. Yeah, but that that's all part of it. Is that. Um, you know, after I left college, uh, I went to a free agent camp. Uh, in Boston and they asked me to come to training camp as basically an invite and I was able to battle my way through that and get a contract um, and then ended up in the American League which is comparable to AAA baseball if people are familiar with that minor league system Uh, blew my knee out uh, in this after two and a half years Um, couldn't play anymore and wanted to go back to school and be an entrepreneur. I hadn't finished college yet. Uh, so I went back to finish my last couple of classes. Um, my buddy was coaching in Stockholm, uh, a professional team over there. He called me uh, and asked me if I wanted to get into coaching. Uh, so 
And at the time, I wasn't really interested in coaching. So I sent back an offer that was much higher than I normally uh, would ask for. And to my surprise, the next day on the fax machine, uh, they, they signed the contract and told me to get on a plane and fly over to Sweden. Yeah, uh, for listeners, you're only like 26 or 27 years old at this stage. Yeah. If I yeah. Remember, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> kind you know, of a young coach, right? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And, and this was before the internet. And I, I faxed the owner of the team, my age and everything, not, not even thinking I'd ever get the job. Um, but he was just, he just wanted a North American coach. And at that time, there weren't that many North American coaches in Europe. Um, and uh, so I landed, two players picked me up in Malmo, about an hour and a half drive from Olofström where I coached. And their first question was, what, which position do I play? And I said, well, I don't, I'm not a player, I'm a coach. <laughs> and then we got to the arena and the owner comes out and right away, uh, speaking through a translator, he didn't speak any English. He just said, oh my gosh, I made a mistake. You're way too young. And I said, well, I told you my age. He's like, well, don't worry about it. I got a bigger problem. I just fired the coach 20 minutes ago and told the press, so I can't take him back. Um so he asked me to coach the team until Christmas time. This is maybe beginning of December. Uh, and, and then he was going to find a new coach. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And then I'll travel a little bit and, and, and visit Europe and then go back, back to the United States. Um, but then we won the, the first seven games. Uh, ended up staying with that team for three years um, before then moving on to, to Germany and, and coaching down there. So that was kind of the start of my coaching career. And again, even there, uh, those first seven games, I had nothing to lose. I was an interim coach, um, just having fun, doing the best I could, and everything just happened. Uh, and we were successful. As soon as I got the contract, it was a lot harder, <laughs> you know, trying to uh, trying to keep it up and and continue uh, going at it like you've got nothing to lose. So something kind of clicked in me mentally at the time. I didn't know what it was. I do know what it is now. Um, and then I made, I coached for, like you said, 27 years, mostly in Europe, in uh, Sweden, Germany, Austria. The last team I coached in Europe was the Red Bull team in, in Salzburg, Austria, probably the best team and the best organization I've ever worked for. Um, and um, I was fortunate enough to coach for six years in, in the Florida Everblades in the ECHL um, and, uh, and, and was fortunate to, to win a championship there. Yeah, let's talk about that just a little bit. Let me stop you right there. So when the Everblades, I think it was uh, the year you won the championship. Yeah. When the Everblades lost, they lost seven games in a row and nine out of ten games during the regular season. The general manager told you if the team lost again, you'd be in trouble. And then, so what did that force you to do again? Did that force you to think, okay, I got nothing to lose again? So then you yeah, did it, better because then you turn the it, team it, around. Yeah, it, it totally put me into that state again. Uh, and I had a very good assistant coach at the time, Brad Tapper, played in the NHL, played for me in Germany. Uh, and Taps was just like, Greg, man, you're doing too much. You got you to just relax and have some fun and, you know, stop micromanaging. And, you know, I, I had such like a lot of athletes and high performers have, they have such a high desire to be successful that any risk of not getting that success can oftentimes become very destabilizing. Um, so I was basically forced to kind of take a step back. Uh, and, and I thought, well, you know something, I'm just going to have fun here and do the best I can. And whatever happens, happens. And I don't, I don't know if we're going to make the playoffs. We'll, we'll see. And all of a sudden, we went on and won 15 of the last 17 games of the season to make the playoffs. And, you know, we had a very good leadership group on that team. In fact, we're going to have a 10-year anniversary of, of that uh, this summer. All the guys are coming oh, back. Wow. So that's going to be a good time. I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of them again. But the team just uh, – uh, I, I, by accident, I empowered the team. Um, and how did you do that? What do you think you did that empowered the team from your mic before you were, you're saying you were micromanaging mm -hmm. now you're empowering this team from a leadership standpoint. What, what do you think you did different? Well, I think what happens is we end up changing. We change our vibrational energy in our body when we're in, um, in a state of fear or, uh, stress, uh, we're actually vibrating at a very low energy level. And, 
even if we do the right things, it's not going to work. It's not going to have a very good result. Uh, whereas other times, if we're in a state of, you know, nothing to lose, I'm going to come in here and do the best I can and see what happens. I can't wait to get after it. And uh, more of that fearless state. Now we're vibrating at a high energy level and automatically the people around us uh, are going to be attracted to that and, and feel that vibe. And it's actually the greatest gift we can give anybody around us. People ask me all the time, what can I do to help people around, around me? And I'm like, work on yourself. First and foremost, you get yourself into that state and you're going to do a great service for everybody around you. Um, and I think that's kind of what happened in, in that situation. And because I'd been in flow state as an athlete and a coach before, I kind of recognized when I was in that state and I kind of rolled the wave on it. And then it was just a unbelievable. Uh, we went into the season, I think, as a sixth seed of eight teams in the East. There were eight teams in the West. And we, we, I think we, we won every series four to one. Wow, the seven, best of seven game series to, to the championship. And it just kind of goes to show that when we, um, when we get into the right state of mind, everything is going to flow around us the way it should, and it's going to optimize our performance. And all through my coaching and playing career, I noticed that it happened kind of serendipity. It wasn't, um, I wasn't able to intentionally do it. And that always frustrated me. I was like, man, how come I can do so well this time as a coach or a player? And I can't do it when I need it the most in the big game or the big moments. Mm -hmm. Um, And now we know we can intentionally put ourselves into that state and, and basically live in that state all the time. And that's the, way to optimize the performance you need to help my buddy john kaplan when he's trying to dock his fishing boat because he goes straight into that lower brain state like fear takes over and then Mm -hmm. there's no telling what could happen there's no flow he's not optimized for performance that's what the bumper guards are for on the side of the boat (laughs) (laughs) hey greg hey greg i want to Good answer. Man. I, I want to tap into this a second through your playing and your coaching career, because so much of what you're talking about is just resonating. And I, I always, when I hear things like this, I'm like, man, if I could have known it when I was younger, if I could have known what was happening to me when I was younger, can you just give us some heads up to get people's attention? Current state, like current state for people, those those little things that are probably happening that could to tell you you're not kind of operating in your, and we're going to go into how you define this of lower brain and higher brain. And, but like current state, what are some of the states that people are in or that you were in that could kind of tell you that like, this is something that you could benefit from. Like I read a story of, you know, you win the championship and then right after you win the championship, you're empty. Uh, yeah. So it really wasn't about the championship. It was about or somebody that nails their their quota and kills it, has a killer year. And then they're, they, they get this fear and panic and anxiety of like, that's over. Didn't celebrate that. And then went into this mode of, oh, my God, how am I going to do it again? So can you give us some like examples so people can kind of tune into it and say, OK, that's me. That's me. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about our motivation, our our motivation for why we're doing something. And when we're uh, not going to be, if we're in a lower brain state, we're motivated by self-esteem and by external pleasure. And when I say self-esteem, I'm talking about lower brain self-esteem, where basically, how do I look in the eyes of others? And that's for 98% of the people, that's their idea of self-esteem. Um, and um, can you imagine that? They call it self-esteem, but actually it's our opinion of ourselves based on what other people think of us. So we want to impress other people or we do it for external pleasure, to make money, to win a trophy, to uh, get a promotion, whatever the case might be. And I'm not saying that going after those things is bad. We should go after those things. But our our, our major motivation has got to be the moment to moment gamification and joy of the journey of the process, whatever we want to call it. And if we're just lost in the moment to moment gamification, joy of our process, now, paradoxically, we're going to produce the best result. And we're taking all that pressure 
off of getting it because we're having so much fun doing what we're doing. Now we can, we can be in the moment, you know, be here now or be nowhere because the past and the future don't even exist. So the more we can be in the moment, we're going to have so much better chance than of making that money, of winning that game, of being successful. Um, even Kobe Bryant, I heard a quote a couple of weeks ago where he said he was never truly successful as a basketball player until he realized the major reward was the process. So he was having, he was so detail oriented and just loved every day trying to get better and improve and getting challenged uh, that when the big games came, he already won before the game started. And that's what puts us into that state of nothing to lose. And now we can go all in because our brains are programmed to avoid pain, not go for gain. So we have to rewire our brains in a way to go for that gain. You see that a lot of times just on the golf course, a guy stands over the ball for two minutes and then hits the ball and slices into the woods. And then he gets really kind of mad, drops the ball, but he's got nothing to lose now, hits the ball straight down the fairway, you know, 250 yards, right? Didn't even think, just stood over it and hit it. So your brain takes over what you talked about before. You're in this flow state. You're optimized for performance. And you, your body and your brain actually almost knows inherently what to do when you're in that state. And you talk Absolutely. in your book about – the part of the brain, the basal ganglia, I think I'm saying that right, where mm -hmm. it can either be programmed as a lower brain or a, or a higher brain. And it's like artificial intelligence in the brain that basically, you know, gives us a different perspective on things based upon, you know, which, which, which brain we're operating in. Yeah. Talk about, Greg, talk about this concept of how you broke the brain into to the lower brain and the higher brain and what that actually means. Yeah. Well, first off, it was Dr. Naraj Jawan who, who did all that, uh, you know, a real medical doctor, a, a dear friend of mine who I met at the University of Wisconsin. And he's been kind of my he, he's my mentor. Uh, and he uh, and it's basically and what I like about love about this program and the system and structure is it's based on science and research. I've got nothing wrong with the esoteric things. Those are awesome uh, and they work, but I like stuff, something that's based on science and research. And now we know scientifically that we have a lower brain and a higher brain, and we cannot be in both brains at the same time based on blood flow. And that's just not geographically speaking. That's functionally. There, there's five networks in the higher brain that are competing with five networks in the lower brain. So when we can... Um, intentionally control our thoughts and kind of rewire our brains to be higher brain dominant, we're automatically turning off our lower brain or the fear centers of our brain. Which, and then there's a big difference between being fearless and reckless. Um, and once we can do that, now we're in a state where we can optimize our performance. And um, like, like Max said, um, our body and brains know what to do, especially at the highest levels, professional levels. Um, and so if we can intentionally get into that higher brain state, um, now we can really take off. Yeah. And in your book, you talk about the lower brain being C fast. It's like an acronym where it's C is craving, fear, mm -hmm. anxiety, stress, and thinking. And then yeah. the higher brain which you want to get into is what you call fast C, focus, awareness, mm -hmm. stability, transcendence, and connectedness, right? Yep. And there's certain things I think you talk about that can trigger us to move either from higher brain to lower brain or, or the other way around. Yeah, yeah. And a great example are the Navy SEALs, well, the most elite fighting force in the world. When they get into a life or death situation, their heart rate sink. They, they, they get they get higher brain, they get focused, aware, stable, transcendent, which are thoughts of joy and connected. And so when we're because they know in that state they're going to be able to optimize their performance and 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 be very effective. Uh, if we get into any kind of a fearful state where it's a craving or a, a fear or anxiety or stress or thinking in particular hyper thinking, that's not going to help. And we're 
for a lot of very good reasons, were programmed to go into lower brain for survival reasons. And it was a great system that worked for a lot of years and passed on our genes and got us to the point where we are in humanity, but we don't need it anymore. It's blocking us. It's getting in the way. We don't need to survive. We need to thrive. And, you know, life, the, the key is to be on the edge of our comfort zone. That's where we want to be. That's where life begins. That's living on the edge of our comfort zone. But if, right now we can it, be triggered a lot because, I mean, after the, with the Internet and, and all the things that are going on around us, I mean, you have all the social media, you got alerts from your phone, the phone's ringing, you know, you're getting buzzed, you got politics, world events, family members talking. There's, there's so much more going on today that can trigger us to move into that lower brain than probably in the past. Wouldn't you say so? Oh, for sure. Think back to the time that I was in college, there were no, there were no computers or cell phones. I took a four credit class on how to use Microsoft word. Uh, I mean, and now uh, we get triggered when we look at our phone, we get triggered when we see a politician on TV, we get triggered and, and it's just not healthy because when we're getting triggered that much, Um, we're releasing cortisol into our body and cortisol actually cuts off access to our higher brain, takes us out of flow state. And at the same time, it's very damaging. Um, A lot of doctors and medical people say that cortisol is is the root of disease and the root word of disease is disease. If we're always in a fearful, uh, angry, upset, frustrated, de-energized, depressed state, we are not going to be physically healthy at all. So if we think you talk a little bit in the book about PDA, pause, delay, and ask questions, especially um, if you think you might be getting triggered. Can you talk a little bit about that, Craig? Yeah, that's just uh, one of the tools we use uh, to prevent our lower brain from getting triggered. Because if we're constantly getting triggered, uh, again, releasing, releasing cortisol, and it's very damaging in a lot of ways. So we might not think that somebody cutting cutting us off in uh, traffic and us giving them the sign that they're number one is is bad, uh, yeah. but in actuality it's not good. Like we no. and the, we need to train our minds in that situation to be like the Navy SEALs to stay calm, not get upset. Because why? What's what's the what's the use of all we're doing is damaging ourselves. All we're doing when we get reactive is we're giving our power away. And I tell athletes all the time. You can be so powerful if we just don't give our power away, but we're constantly doing it. So that's a great example. Somebody cuts us off in traffic. Are we going to get angry about it? If we feel we start, we might start to get angry about it. We can use, we can pause, just put on the brakes, just stop, delay, build in a delay. It could be taking two or three deep breaths. It could be, uh, You know, if if you're talking to somebody and they're tricking you, you could be pretend like you're writing something down or looking at your phone, but it's built in some space. Then ask yourself the three questions. Is this life or death? And in 99.9% of the uh, situations, it's never life or death, but we're treating it like it. The person's going four miles an hour and they they pull in front of us in traffic. No one's going to die. It's not life or death. Don't treat it like it. And the second question is, is this about being right or powerful and influential? Being right is the biggest waste of time ever. Absolute waste of time. We don't want to get triggered because of our righteous ignomation and because we're right. Um, you know, we want to we want to be powerful and influential. And then we have to be higher brain and not give our power away. And then by the time we get to the third question, am I higher or lower brain? You can say, oh, you know, some I'm pretty higher brain. Um, and it helps when we do actual exercises to train these systems. And what we're doing is we're actually, like we said, we, we control the blood flow in our brain with our thoughts. So we're diverting blood flow and energy away from our lower brain. We're diverting blood flow and energy to our higher brain and through neuroplasticity, which, which just means we can grow our brains from the day we die. We're actually growing our larger brain larger that serves us and we're shrinking our lower brain that blocks us. So we can become mentally stronger, more higher brain dominant until the day we die. And if we just visualize situations that could be triggering for us and we can use the tool PDA, then when they happen, we automatically stay calm in those situations. Doesn't mean we're not going to hold people accountable. We're not going to turn the other cheek. We're going to hold people ruthlessly accountable, but 
we're going to do it from a higher brain place. And now we've got a much better chance to be effective in changing their behavior. Yeah. Johnny, I've seen the, uh, I've seen the science on this where they've actually, and Greg, I'm sure you've seen this too, where they've actually uh, measured uh, the size of the components of the lower brain and Mm -hmm. the higher brain. And for people that have the ability to stay in the higher brain, the components of the higher brain, the specific components are actually larger uh, and vice versa for, uh, for the lower brain. It's, it's really amazing. So the big thing I think is kind of tapping into, I think it's so hard. We talk about triggers. We talk about pressures of everything around us. We have access to incredible amounts of stimulus um, the hard part, I think, is, you know, being aware and being present in the moment. So, like, things happen to us and there's things happening to us and we're still performing. We are still, um, uh, you know, maintaining our place in life. But these things are happening to us and we miss an opportunity. And that's this mindfulness and this presence and this awareness What have you seen in the research, Greg, on, you know, tapping into just being aware of what the heck is going on in your mind and body? Because what's happening in the mind is probably producing um, stimulus in the body. Um, How have you found that connection, mind-body, and being aware, uh, being aware of it and being present with it? Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think, you know, mindfulness is, is great. I think uh, the higher brain, higher brain, lower brain system is mindfulness on steroids. Uh, because now you have a system, you have an awareness plus a system and structure to get to where you need to be. And you know exactly uh, the, the thoughts and the states that you need to be in to be, to be successful. Um, and now you're, and again, it's, it's never something that's happening to us that's triggering us. It's our thoughts about it. Yeah. And that's our chance. So if we can control our thoughts, now we can be in great chaos, but we can be, uh, we can be calm on the inside. We can be higher brain on the inside. We can perform optimally on the inside. And that's the, the real key to it because we, 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 want to, we want to be in difficult situations. We want to be in chaos on the edge of our comfort zone because that's where we can learn and grow. And, and that's living. We don't want to be comfortable. We want to learn how to be mentally comfortable in very uncomfortable situations. And um, again, if we don't have a system and structure to do that, it's very difficult to to do it consistently. And that's what I've found with with, uh, this training. And I think that's why it's had a great, great results on on people who are doing it. What I've always found, Greg, for me, for me, if I'm in lower brain, And the way it affects me personally is I can tell by my breath, because I think there's only two Mm -hmm. things we can control, our thoughts and our breath, right? At the end of the day, that's all we have. When we don't have our breath, we're gone anyway, right? So uh, the way that I know it affects me is my breath becomes shorter. And I'm more like almost, let's say, from my chest, my lower chest up, I'm breathing more shallow. And when I'm in higher brain, I don't even know if I'm feeling my breath, but I know it's coming from all the way down near my belly button, right? It's coming deep. It's deep, yeah. slow breaths versus the short, you know, fast breaths. Then I know, shit, I, you know, this is just not right. Something's not right right now. That's how I feel it myself. Yeah. <clears throat> and Greg, probably most people in, I'm the exact same way, Johnny, and I can actually feel like this, it's probably cortisol, Greg. I can feel it as it goes through my body. And, and the, so many times you just kind of, you keep going. You don't address yeah. it. You don't deal with it. You just keep going like it's like you're in denial and like it's going to go away. So again, that, um, that awareness is, um, is, is huge here. Let's dig in a little bit more to, okay, we've kind of talked about the, um, the, where we want to be. We've talked about wanting to be in the higher brain, wanting to be in the thinking brain, being less in the feeling brain and more in the thinking brain. Um, 
Give us some strategies on actually how to do that. How do we, how do we do it? Yeah. Well, I, I would say, actually, we, we, we don't want to be in our thinking brain as much. I'm not saying we don't want to think. But yeah. When we're performing, uh, we, want, we want to perform with our subconscious. Our conscious mind, our subconscious mind is so much faster and more efficient than our, than our conscious mind. Uh, but we don't trust it, so we, we don't use it like we should. Um, but once we get into a higher brain state, now we can go into difficult situations fearlessly. We can trust our subconscious mind. It's like in hockey. You get a puck in the slot. You make a move. You shoot it quick. Within a fraction of a second, it goes post and in. And you're skating to the bench. You're like, man, did I get lucky? How did that happen? Yeah. But how, That's how the same know, players? A guy like Connor McDavid must always be in the flow state, man. When you see him oh, yeah. handle right past four people, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. He's not it, thinking. It, you can't think. It's happening no, you can't. too fast. Yeah. There's, there's no time. And, and our, our, our subconscious, and what, what happens is when we're lower brain dominant, we cannot trust our subconscious. A great example is there are a lot of very intelligent criminals get caught because they, they, they make very simple mistakes because they, they can't trust their intuition. They can't trust their subconscious. But if we, the more higher brain dominant we are, the more we train our basal ganglia, like you talked about earlier, Mac, the, the more we can then uh, trust our intuition, trust our subconscious and let our body and brain do what it knows how to do. And um, that, that's, that's huge. And we talked about breathing and, you know, we've known that breathing has been important for the last 5,000 years. They've talked about it in martial arts and, and, and things of that nature, but it's so important because as soon as we start breathing shallow and quickly, we're sending our brain the danger signal. We're saying to our brain, Hey, it's dangerous out there. Be careful, yes. get conservative. You know, it might be some pain coming. And so we, we start to get fearful. So that's how our breath can control our brain. If we can slow our breath down and we just teach a very simple breathing technique uh, that a Harvard uh, doctor developed and has been clinically proven to help with anxiety and stress called four, seven, eight breathing, where you breathe yeah. in for four, hold for seven, breathe out for eight. In actuality, any breathing, there's box breathing, there's a, a, a bunch of different kinds, any kind of work, but any kind of intentional breathing where we're slowing our breath down, especially under stressful situations, we're now sending the safe signal to our brain. Everything's okay out there. We can go in here like we got nothing to lose and have a good time. And paradoxically, that is when we're going to perform our best. Yeah. And that's when you talk about in your book, you talk about failing fast. You talk about, you know, when you're operating in the higher brain, you don't really care about failing because you're just trying to improve. So, you know, you could try it once, twice, three times, four times, five times till you keep getting incrementally better because you don't care about failing. And now you've kind of mastered a certain skill. Yes. All great performers fail their way to the top. All successful people fail their way to the top. The difference is, uh, they're not happy when they fail, but they're not de-energized, depressed. Uh, they're not. Uh, uh, they're not angry. Uh, they, they analyze it. And what I say to athletes is, things don't go your way. Worst case scenario, be businesslike. Don't don't drop low zero. Don't don't uh, not see what's around you or be aware because now you're not going to learn from those situations. And when we fail. Every time we fail, there's an opportunity to learn and get better and improve. And if we uh, if we get too lower brain about it, we're not going to make that improvement that we need to make to get to where we want to go. Give us some advice on, <clears throat> I hear you say a lot, at least I saw you, um, I, I might have seen you in, a, uh, in an interview or in, in your book as well. You talk about focusing on the process and not the result. And for our listeners, we live in a results-driven meritocracy. Um, you perform, you get the reward, you get the result. Give us some advice on how to make that a reality. Focus on the process and not the result. I'm assuming the flip side of that is when you focus on the process, the results will just come. But how do you get that message across? Yeah, I think a good way to put it is that the, the results are secondary. We're not saying they're not important. They're obviously very important. But uh, focusing on them, 
what happens is we, we want something really badly. We desire it. We crave it. And any risk of not getting it, like I said before, becomes very lower brain triggering. The more we trigger our lower brain, the more we're actually through neuroplasticity growing the brain that blocks us, which makes getting that not getting that result or that outcome a self-fulfilling prophecy. And when we can uh, realize, okay, the results are important, but it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is the journey, the process that I'm on and, and growing and developing. We call that being creatively fearless. When we can be creatively fearless in our task, we're having so much fun in the process. Now we can really enjoy the journey, which like you said, uh, Cap, it'll give us paradoxically the best chance of getting that result is by not focusing on it. And what, 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 what are results? People say, well, they're, they're measuring devices. All it does is give us more information about our process so that we can dive back into it and make necessary corrections and improvements to get the same or better result the next time. Um, and that's what we call a virtual cycle. So the way we think or celebrate success is super important. You know, a, 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 a player like Tom Brady, when he's, I think he's, I don't know him personally, but just from all the articles and everything he's done and the way he's failed his way to the top, uh, I would say he's a very higher brain athlete uh, mm -hmm. intuitively. Um, and when he wins a Super Bowl, I don't imagine you know, he's got the, he's got the, 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 the trophy is holding it above his head. He's having a great time. He's celebrating, but in the back of his head, he's like, man, that was really cool how I did this and this, and it worked out. And I changed this a little bit and we had a good result. I can't wait for next train camp. I'm going to enjoy this. I'm going to, I'm going to go on vacation. I'm going to have a great summer, but man, I can't wait for train camp to start because there's two or, two or three other things I want to work on where I think I can make my process even better next time. Mm. And now we're taking the result and it's actually motivating us to dive back into the process, which will give us even a better result next time. And that's that virtual cycle that keeps going up and up and up. In, yeah. the, uh, in the Navy SEALs, they have this uh, this process called the hot wash. And I'm really tapping into what you're saying, Greg. It's like, I'm thinking about the stories that I've read about, <clears throat> you know, like Sabin and they win the national championship. And I think they actually might do it a little bit to a detriment to themselves, but they're already recruiting. They're in the locker room. They celebrate really quick. And then they go into a corner and they're calling the recruits. And so they're really kind of focused on the process. And somewhere there's probably a um, a happy medium there. Uh, but in the Navy SEALs, what I like about what you're saying, Greg, or any elite organization that has this kind of immediate feedback on the process, they have this principle called the hot wash that says right after a campaign, whatever they do, wherever, right after a mission, they immediately debrief and they talk about what went well. What do they like about what they just did? And what caused them pause? I'm paraphrasing. They don't use that language. Yeah. That's the language I use in business today. And what causes you pause? Because you are so close to the reality of what just happened that yeah, taking yeah. the time to do that allows you to get your greatest thinking and insights. And that's probably what Brady and all these elite athletes are doing is right after a championship, right after a um, a failure, whatever it is, they're going into this hot wash immediately and being realistic and, and open and honest with themselves. So I really like that principle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that hot wash concept is, is awesome. And, and we, we call that aim, analyze, iterate, move forward, regardless yeah. of a win or a loss, you analyze it, you iterate, make a few changes and you move forward. You try it again and you keep doing that process as quickly as possible until you get, until you get to where you want to go. Now, Greg, you have um, <clears throat> even some young hockey players that you, uh, you know, coach. And a lot of times they're trying to go up a level and trying to, you know, make the team. So they're focused sometimes on the results, right? Taking them into mm -hmm. the low, lower brain. And that's pretty tough when, you know, you're trying to make a team because that, that is all you're really thinking about. So how do you get them out of that lower brain? What do, you, what do you advise them to do when they're constantly just thinking about the result? Maybe they're too tight, they're not flowing, they're not optimized for performance. 
yeah, and that happens a lot. We're, we, we get triggered. We're in, a, we're, in a, we're in a lower brain state. And how do you get out of there? Well, we teach one tool that gets us out of the lower brain guaranteed. And uh, we call it false story. And false story is um, when something doesn't go our way or we have a big fear of failure, oftentimes we feel a discomfort someplace in our body, some people in their chest, some people in their head. I feel it in my stomach. It's important to identify where you feel it so you know, okay, I'm in a triggered lower brain state. I'm not going to play very well in this state. I'm not going to wait for something on the outside to get me out of this state. I'm going to use my thoughts to get out of that. So that's the recognition that we're in a triggered state. And all that is, is our lower brain giving us what we call a dopamine deficiency. And dopamine lights up our brain like crack cocaine. It's a, a punishment reward system. So it's kind of punishing us, hoping that we react really quickly to try to solve the situation. Again, a great system for keeping us alive and putting us in the fight or flight mode, um, right. to, but it doesn't help us now. It actually hurts us a lot. So false stories is the realization that there is no external gratification that's going to make us happy the rest of our life. You know, whether it's a hot foot Sunday or winning the Stanley Cup, they're both external gratifications. And none of those things are going to make us happy the rest of our life. Is winning a Stanley Cup going to make us more happy than eating a hot fudge Sunday? Of course, but still it's not sustainable. The only way to have sustainable happiness and success and fulfillment is to uh, is through internal gratification, which we get in the creative fearlessness of our process or our journey. And once we realize that we, we don't make such a big deal about outcomes, not that they're not important, but making a big deal about them just isn't going to help. We need to let go of them and realize that the real joy is the moment to moment gamification of the process. Yeah. It also strikes me that you have to basically, you have to accept that in the performance, in the process where you're trying to get better, you have to accept that it's your fault so that you can iterate on it. You can't blame mm -hmm. it on somebody else, which you see a lot in society today. Everybody's trying to blame somebody else. They say they're the victim. You have to accept, hey, the reason I'm in this situation, the reason I'm trying to get better is I got to accept the fact that I, I mishandled this, I failed, and I need to improve and iterate through this process, right? Yeah. And, and as soon as you, as soon as I hear an athlete start, oh, if I was in this situation, oh, if the coach would play me more. Or the ref. Uh, yeah. Or the, you know, the referee made a bad call. It's like, who cares? Yeah. You know, let's stay there for a second though are those some triggers like because that happens to a lot of people there a trigger could be it's everybody else's fault but mine and you're hearing yourself say that and you're like look i'm not owning it's like i'm blaming everybody else and and that's a trigger and what you're saying greg is um the in in johnny mac what you guys are saying is kind of grabbing that if you hear yourself doing that that that's a an awareness of okay, hold it. I am, uh, I'm, I'm being a victim, or I can't do this because the comp plan. I don't have the right resources. The product's not working, and those could all be portions of those could be true. But what I've also seen is like people that the most elite people I've met are the ones that can take that scenario and say, okay, that's how do I how do I become the hero in this story? Like mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, I'm the victim in this story. And how do I become the hero in this story? And it probably tied into what you're talking about here, Greg, is the false story. It's like you're aware that you're, I'm playing out a false story right now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the reason why we go into victim mode is because our lower brain, and this is from Nobel prize winning studies is programmed two to three times stronger to avoid pain than go for gain. Yeah. So, yeah. and, and what happens oftentimes to avoid that pain, players don't do their best at the highest levels. Because if you do your best and fail, that's really painful. But their lower brain says, okay, I, I'm going to help you out here. We're not going to, we're not going to be successful here, but we're going to minimize this pain by not going all in. Let's blame somebody else. Let's blame the coach. Let's blame the referee. Let's blame, you know, whatever uh, our circumstances, our lot in life. And once we go into that victim mode, we have zero chance of playing to our potential or optimizing our performance. Um, so th that's an awareness that we, we got to 
stop that right there. Use the tool false story to get out of there as quickly as possible. And, you know, who cares how rough the waters are? Bring the boat home. Like, that's all that matters. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and oftentimes, when you're put into those difficult situations is when you make your greatest breakthroughs yes. and your biggest yeah. gains. And people miss out on that because it's too easy to blame somebody else. I could right. have made it, but, you know, this person stopped me. No. Like that's again, in athletes all the time. There's always the, the 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 conflict between coach athlete and certain players play better for other coaches. And at the end of the day, it's like you got you got to play for anybody. Who I mean, I mean this with all respect for coaches. I was a coach for 27 years, but who cares who the coach is? Find a way, make the best you can, and move forward. And one of my favorite shirts that I saw, like after I can't remember where I saw it. Um, it was somewhere in sports and somebody was wearing a shirt that said, and it was a high performing athlete. And they had a shirt that said, nobody cares, play better. Yeah. It was so good. It yeah. was so good. It was like all the excuses, all the, and at the end of the day, find a way for you, you yourself to play better. I thought that's really, really yeah. appropriate to what we're talking about here. Cap, I've always thought yeah. that there's two buckets in life and in business too, because you hear people always complaining, especially in sales. Oh, marketing get, didn't get me leads. The SE didn't do what they were supposed to do. I always think there's two buckets. There's a control bucket and a not control bucket. And whatever you're in control of, you better master that. And stop worrying about the stuff that you can't control. If you master the stuff underneath your control, you'll be highly successful. Love stop that. worrying about the stuff you can't control. I love yeah. that. And, and, and part of the issue is we've got so many bad examples around us. There, there are so many athletes uh, that go about things in a lower brain way. Uh, and they're very successful because they're so talented and they're a little bit lucky. But you got to think, how much success and happiness are they leaving on the table by doing it that way? Mm -hmm. A lot. Um, and so we, we can't watch the U.S. Open and watch a guy break his tennis racket four times and win the championship and think that's okay to do that. No, that's lower brain. That's not going to help us at all. Um, anytime we get reactive, we lose. Yeah. Well, on that, you know, I don't know why, you know, you picked tennis for that one, but the person that used to seem – like they were lower brain was John McEnroe. McEnroe. He could literally steam over, yell at the, the, uh, the chair umpire, you know, scream at the ball boy and then grab the ball and ace the next serve. How he ever moved from that, what seemed like lower brain and maintained his higher brain status was just something I've never really seen in sports before. Even since somebody that could do that in the next second, you know, ace something. He was I, would look at it, I would look at it a different way. He was an amazing athlete and I'm surely not judging him. I would never. Uh, what could he have been? He, he could have been so. Uh, yeah. Perhaps if he went Ooh. in a higher brain way, he could, no have been so, he could have enjoyed uh, himself so much. I mean, didn't. I looked, yeah. I looked at I, it I, the wrong I, way. I, You're right. I worked, with, I worked with a lot of tennis players, probably the mentally most talent, most challenging sport, because if you're having a bad day in one area, you're getting more of it, <laughs> you know, yeah. other team sports, you got, you got, you got somebody to help you. Yes. You got a goalie. If you make a mistake golf, if you're not hitting a draw, you can hit a fade. Uh, but in tennis, if you're having a bad day in one area and they sniff a little bit of blood, they're coming at you hard and just redoubling it. Um, so um, uh, you know, we, we talk a lot about that kind of stuff and, you know, you watch old tapes of him playing, you know, he looks like he's happy. Sometimes most of the time looks like he's pissed off. Yeah. And I think you're right. You know, yeah. But let, let me, uh, a great question is, and, and all the top companies are doing this when it comes to building their cultures. You know, when, when we, when we look at what's the most important thing for performing well, is it, is it money? Is it fame? Is it sense of play? Is it learning new skills? Or is it having a purpose? Purpose. What do you guys purpose. think? Yeah. Purpose, hands down. Yeah. And 95% of the people say purpose. But the truth is, it's sense of play. Well, you didn't mention that one. You tricked us. <laughs> I would have said sense of play. <laughs> <laughs> but I never knew that. 
but it, 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 what a what a great thing. I mean, the more fun I have, the, the more success I'm going to have. You know, yeah. we're programmed yeah. to think that success has to be painful. Of course, it's hard work. But, you know, I saw a video of Wayne Gretzky when he was 21 years old. He won the scoring championship three times in a row. In the video, it looks like he's about 14 years old. That's how good he was at a young age. Right. And the reporter is like, man, that must have been a, you must have worked really hard to, to get as good as you are. And Gretzky looked at him and says, you know something? If somebody told me it was work, I wouldn't have done it. I was having fun. Yeah. I got home from school at three. I skated for six hours outside because that was the thing that I loved and enjoyed doing the most. So it's not a surprise that he was able to put the time and quality time in and bring himself to such a high level. And all those things are important. You know, making money, you got to put food on the table, getting recognition, uh, learning new skills, having a purpose. Of course, those are all super important. But by far, the most important thing is sense of play. Yeah. And we're not talking sure. about passive pleasure. We make a, a big definition between what we call going to the beach fun, which is passive pleasure, and eat fun. Eat fun is engaged, activated, and thrilled with the moment-to-moment -moment joy of our task. Engaged, and activated, and fun, you said. Thrilled, thrilled. Thrilled, engaged, activated, and thrilled. Yeah, love it. it th th that's the most fun we can have, scientifically proven. Like, so if we're on the edge of our comfort zone, building a business, learning new things, diving into things, being destabilized sometimes, then coming back, that's where we want to be. Um, and having that eat fun, having that sense of play is going to produce the best result. Awesome. That's so relevant, Johnny Mac, to our listeners in business is that <clears throat> the um, edge of comfort zone and the sense of play and that flow state that happens when you're really like people listening to this podcast, they probably are already a student of the game. And so <laughs> They, they, they don't listen to these things or, or learn new things because it's work. They learn new things because they get that neuroplasticity, Greg, because they, their brain actually craves learning new things and taking that to mastery. And so that's another great point to make if you're out there listening one way, you know, another tool uh, that you're alluding to, Greg, is also, you know, not you know, not staying in any, you know, getting a flow state, but looking for more and more new flow states to learn new, more and challenging things and being on the edge of your comfort zone. I heard you say that two or three times. Oh, yeah. I mean, if, if we get to the top of the mountain, that's fun and we should celebrate it. But then we got to find a new mountain. Really find a quick. new mountain. Because being on it. that side of the mountain and battling and find little crevices and trying to climb higher and scrapping and crawl, crawling, that's living. That's that's the that's that's the that's fun. That's what well I want done. to be. Well done, Johnny, Johnny you Mac. Try to do a little rap. I'm going to do a little rap. I'm I'm like all of these podcasts we're doing. Our guests do such an incredible job of sharing yeah. these golden nuggets. So I'm going to do my best here and give uh, give a little recap, Greg. If I if I mm -hmm. uh, um, if I miss anything, you guys both fill me in there. We started about one of the themes that you talked. Uh, to in the beginning here, which I love this, this, and I think I'm going to write it down uh, and just have it on my desk. The state of nothing to lose is where, um, uh, it's where we, where we thrive the most. And you talked about any risk to that success creates problems. So when we focus mm -hmm. on the success, we focus on the outcomes that creates the more risk associated. And then we, in a sense, we just kind of mentally tighten up. You talked about vibrating on low energy and needing to change that to vibrating on high energy, which happens from the, uh, the higher brain. Um, you talked about lower brain motivation, which is self-esteem and external pleasure <clears throat> versus the joy of the journey, the flow state. Um, and uh, the major reward being, uh, uh, the process of competing versus uh, the actual win at the end. Um, you, you've talked a lot about lower brain and higher brain, and the lower brain was characterized by the CFAST, uh, craving, fear, anxiety, stress, and thinking. And we're going to point to your book, 
We'll do a link to your book so people can dig into this farther. And the higher brain was on fast dick, uh, F-A-S-T-C, which was focus, awareness, <clears throat> stability, transcendence, and connectedness. Um, and the, um, the key is to be on the edge of our comfort zone. You talked about a strategy to help us get out of a lower brain by pausing, delaying, and asking ourselves questions like, is this life or death? Um, am I in higher brain or lower brain? So pausing, delay, and then asking questions. We can only control our thoughts. Um, and then, Johnny, you added, we can only control our thoughts and our breathing, which I thought right. was a great ad. Right. Lower brain dominant, you can't trust your subconscious. Um, and so that, to me, meant so much because you, you'll struggle with letting go. You'll struggle with just letting go and doing. You'll struggle, Johnny, like I struggle getting uh, over that over that uh, ball on the first tee and I'm overthinking my grip. I'm overthinking instead of just gripping and ripping it and just yeah. telling yourself that, that I'm ready to go. You also gave a and breathing dock technique. In the boat. And dock in the boat too. And dock in the boat. Yeah. <laughs> you would have been proud of me. You would have been proud of me yesterday though, dude. Hands my, <laughs> hands my witness. Like you slam straight into the bumpers? No, time, dude. But... I came in with, here's you the thing, flowing. Greg. You this is such a great example. Uh -huh. I came into the dock, Greg, and there's no spots. There's a little spot which will barely fit the boat. And yeah. I come in. And, and I, normally he'd me. be like, oh, <laughs> my God. Your breathing would immediately go from his throat up. Totally. She looks at me. Ann looks at me, and I look at her. And I'm committed. Like, I can't turn around in this marina. Like, I got to go for it. And I just let go. And got in there and, and docked it. Nice. I got to remember how to stay in that flow state there. <laughs> Failing your way to the top, um, uh, you talked about. I loved it. You talked about another tool, which was the false story. Um, getting out of okay. the lower brain. No okay. external um, <clears throat> uh, no external gratification is going to make us happy the rest of our life. Only internal gratification. Um, I love that. I'm going to get a t-shirt made up and I'm just going to wear it on the next podcast. Nobody cares. <laughs> Play better. Um, the control bucket versus the can't control bucket, Johnny. And then mm. Greg, you tricked me a little bit on the purpose one. If you had said sense of play, now I'm going to remember it forever. Uh, but you <laughs> said sense of play and being on the edge of the comfort zone mm. is where our greatest developments come from. What did I miss boys? Nothing. Uh, you, um, you got it all. Sound all right, let's do this. If you're up for it, Greg, um, let's do a little rapid fire. First of all, thanks so much for your time today. Uh, again, I feel like we just kind of scratched the surface. So <clears throat> I hope everybody out there um, goes and gets your book, which we'll put a book in the uh, we'll put a link to the book in the show notes. Rapid fire questions. Ideal day off work, buddy. What's the ideal day off work? Playing golf. Oh, nice. You'll be right in there with Johnny Mac. <laughs> Favorite meal? Uh, steak and potatoes. Nice. From Wisconsin. Good call. You got to have some middle. cheese in there. <laughs> <laughs> you got to oh, yeah. have, is that potatoes au gratin? That's potatoes no, au gratin. It, 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 no, it's, it's, it's uh, twice baked potatoes with little cheddar cheese on top. All right. There you go. <laughs> Favorite movie. Uh, favorite movie. I already know this one. Miracle. The last no, The Last Samurai. Oh, good one. All Last right. Samurai. You liked yeah, Miracle, exactly. though, didn't you? It was great. It was really good, yeah. All right. Yeah. Kirk and Douglas then, did a great job with her books. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he did a great job. And then best concert you've ever been to? Uh, Guns N' Roses, 1991, Stockholm, Sweden. Oh, wow. It was, it was awesome. A head they, 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 they came on stage at 1 o'clock in the morning. They were three hours straight. And Axl Rose got up there, grabbed the mic. He goes, we're professionals. We're not coming on until til we're ready. And then they went nuts for three hours. It was great. That's <laughs> awesome. Greg, you did an unbelievable job for our listeners. Thanks for uh, your grace and letting us ask you questions all over the, all over the board there and, and just getting a great outcome for our listeners. It's a pleasure to meet you. And I can't wait to put these, uh, I can't wait to put some of these things in, uh, uh, in process. Well, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks, buddy. Really appreciate it. 
You crushed yeah, it. Well done. Grateful for having you. And wow. everyone, thanks a lot for listening to another episode of the Revenue Builders Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Be sure to check us out at forcemanagement.com.